and so it's below tangible book value per share. So this is a nice, you're buying a below tangible book, there's some significant growth, they do about 7% on equity. What I love though is the chairman's letter really embodies this kind of the sign of the time. So he has a paragraph where he dwells on the regulatory pressure, the challenging environment, how hard it is to be a banker right now. And as an, as an investor, that's exactly what I wanna see because this, this bank is tired and they're, they're tired of, of operating in this environment. And if someone offers them a, a good payday, they're most likely gone. So if you put this through the, the, three, mo the, the three valuations, uh, it's a, to peers, it'd be about 23, 60, 24 dollars, say 24, to an acquirer, 27, and the, you know, they're repurchasing some shares, uh, discount dividends right in there as well. They trade at 17. So it's uh, another one to, to add to the basket. And then finally, we have FPB Financial. These guys are a holding company for Florida Parish's bank. So if anyone thought it must be a bank in Florida that got hit, by the, hit hard by the financial crisis, you'd be mistaken because they are in rural Louisiana and they are um, kind of a backwater bank as well. And it, so I should point out that that's an interesting, if there's a theme to all of these, it's these aren't banks in big cities. These are not banks in affluent suburbs. These are banks in Hammond, Louisiana, or in Paris, Illinois, places that no one even really knows about. You fly over in an airplane, and, and they're the ones who are gonna be purchased by PNC or Regions or one of the larger players, or even a smaller player who wants to become larger, and, and that's, that's what's driving this. So Florida Parishes is 200 million, 230 million in assets. They did 12.5% on their equity last quarter, and I, I really like this. So they know how to make money on small assets. They've done 10% on equity over the last decade. So during the financial crisis, they were still doing, doing above 10% on equity. So it's a, it's a fairly well-run bank. They are overcapitalized. All of these banks are overcapitalized, as I said, no credit issues. Uh, and this is a, so, you know, one thing with credit and risk and all this, and I think this scares a lot of investors away as they say, Banks are risky. It's really hard to know what's going on. So we, we came up with, in our software, an interesting risk model, a, a risk scoring. And we scored banks on, on, it's about 22 different metrics. And it's trends, trends compared to peers, capital, capital ratios, metrics. And we pump all that through this formula and we come up with a risk score. And it's, it's very predictive. So high risk banks end up being taken over by the FDIC. Low risk banks are, are safe investments. Moderate risk banks are fairly safe as well. And so all of these are, are low to moderate risk banks. And it's a good check. So you could just you know, pull that number up and you say, there's you know, essentially no issues. Now I could do a deeper dive. Or you see there's some risky issues. You just walk away right away. And when you're looking through a lot of banks, I look at the risk score first because I don't want to waste my time with something that could be dicey. That, that's how you lose money. So the question on them is, why are they cheap? And I think they're cheap because while management knows how to run a bank really well, I, they do some very weird things with their, their shares and their, their capital. So they, they have some trust preferred securities, which is a kind of a strange hybrid security that was popular before the financial crisis, not very popular now, they have enough money to pay these off. That's, that's essentially a non-issue. Uh, another, the bigger issue is they had a private placement in 2013 and they've just been sitting on the cash. So they said, we wanna grow and they've done nothing. So, you know, what's going on there? And then two weeks ago, I saw in the news, they did a, a three for two split no justification, they just thought this is something we should do. I mean, so, so why are they doing these things? I, I'm not sure, but that's, that's something potentially depressing the stock. So they're, they're worth about 32 to an acquirer, trade at, at 1674. This is something I've been talking about on, um, on a blog in the newsletter for a couple months, and they, they're up about 40% since then. But I think, you know, I think that they could still almost double from here. And if they traded with peers, it would be $23. So even if they just traded up with peers, people notice them. 
there, there's some significant upside. So with that, with that marathon run through these names, and, and I have a ton more if anyone's interested. Uh, and it, like I said, this is just a sample that this is an attractive space and there are a ton of these things. Uh, but I, what I would say is buy these banks like you would buy groceries. So wh what I mean by that is, you know, when you go to the grocery store and avocados are on sale, you're buying as many avocados and you're doing guacamole that week. And then, you know, a couple weeks later when fruit, some fruit's on sale, you're having a fruit salad. And what you might find in this space is for at one period, you might own a number of banks in the Midwest, Illinois or Indiana. And then six months later, they're all in Southern California. And I, I think you'll spin your wheels trying to find the best cheap bank. Instead, just buy small positions and a number of them. And it's the aggregate value that is gonna, gonna provide growth to the portfolio. So I, I have time for some questions, and if you this sparks some questions or some thoughts, you could my email's up here. I'll post this presentation on our website, and then if you're interested in giving the, the software a trial, we, we have it set up in the back, so if anyone wants to research these, get a test drive, you could do that. You could also find us on the web, completebankdata.com, or on your Bloomberg apps, banks, go. So um, any questions? That's a great question. And it, it, the question was, what, how, how does agriculture affect the value of these banks? So, uh, <coughs> I guess I have two answers to that. The first is banks are, there's the land value part of the equation and then the operating value part of the equation. So the land value, land prices are elevated because of low interest rates and uh, returns are, are much lower historically than you would expect for, for farms because of that. And I think, so uh, I believe a, a lot of these banks aren't going full bore into the, to the land value because the land lending, because they know this pattern that happens. So when the market gets hot, it's harder to get a loan. Operating, the operating is, is tough. And from bankers I've talked to who do agricultural lending, they look at it as almost a full cycle lending. So it's, they know that in good years, they're gonna be repaid on the loans. And then in the bad years, they're gonna have some issues they're gonna have to work out, but that will all be made whole on the good years. And so I think what you get is banks that have these relationships with the, with the farmers do well over the full cycle. Some banks that want to get into it, and this is where the danger is. So you have a bank that's primarily a residential lender and they say, we need, we need more growth. We're gonna go into commercial. They're the ones who are lending at the top and they're late to the game and they'll take the bath when, when agriculture takes a hit. I think it's this, this one here. Right, and so, and that's a great question. And I think, I think that's why you wanna have some of your portfolio in the banks that are going to be acquired and then some in the banks that are, are acquiring. And so when you own the banks that are acquiring, what's difficult as an investor is it's hard to motivate these banks to sell. It's a very formal type of industry and you know, it's not cutthroat. And so bankers always want to be on friendly terms with each other. And it's a very, you know, we don't, we will not just buy your shares and do a hostile takeover. It's a very friendly type thing. And so if you are buying the acquirer, you have kind of an in to someone who knows how to play by those rules. And some hedge funds who are trying to push for the, you know, these acquisitions they aren't looked upon as, as well as a banker who's, who's doing it themselves. So you know, time is definitely working against it, and I think that's why you need to do, go with the grocery model. You just, you, you own a number of them. I will answer that question in two ways. Single branch banks can be very attractive investments 
because if you, so think about a single branch bank that's earning maybe a million dollars a year. So if you fire the CEO, the CFO, and the loan officer, you've pretty much doubled your earnings. And so to someone buying the bank, that's really attractive. Bank of Utica is a bond fund masquerading as a bank that operates off cheap deposits. And they're extremely cheap. They're something like 50% of book value right now. I don't know if they'll ever sell. I believe the, the CEO and his son run it. And the, the telling thing for me is if you look at the website, there's a picture of them next to their Bloomberg. So you know, they're, they're not traditional bankers, whatever they say, they, they have a small token amount of loans in, in New York. But if you own them, you're essentially buying a closed end bond fund at a significant discount, I think is a way to look at it. All right, thank you very much. If you have any questions, you can find me afterwards. So we're going to uh, break out into, we're gonna have, we have two tracks. There's track one, which is right outside the room here. And was it Tom Thompson? I, I think it's Tom Thompson is track two. So companies will be giving, giving presentations. If you signed up for a one-on-one, -on -one, they will be in here. We're going to put company names on all the tables and uh, you know, find the company. We have your schedule up front if, uh, if you need that for the one-on-ones. Quick okay. announcement. So let's hear it for Nate. Uh, quick announcement, so Biocyan is going to be in track two because of the number of participants here. So that's at the end of the hall, like Nate said, and that'll be starting in just a few minutes.